Okay, I can see we've got uh, quite a few people on and the numbers aren't climbing anymore. And it's just after four. So we're going to get started and, uh, and kick this thing off. So if you can go to the next slide. So my name's Angus McDonald. I'm a senior product manager at Terum. I head up the product team. Um, and uh, yeah, got a bunch of experience doing product management, a bunch of experience doing consulting. I get to do both at Terum, which is fantastic. Um, I'm also a newbie at uh, smoking uh, food with Traeger, which I just got for my, my most recent birthday. And uh, I'm loving that. So if, if you don't want to talk about software or you want to talk about uh, smoking brisket, then I'm your guy and uh, love to do it. And uh, I, I'm really looking forward to you guys hearing from David Pereira this afternoon. A Brazilian who's gone to Germany and has uh, really got a great uh, amount of experience in product management and shares that willingly with people through his um, YouTube and, and blog. And I'll let David introduce himself and tell you a bit more about himself. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm David. So let me talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I am the head of product management at Virtual Identity. Currently, this is a company in Germany and we have office in Porto, Vienna, Freiburg and Munich. But other than that, I also have 10 years of experience in product management from startups to big corporations, like really vast different uh, set of flavors, I would say. I have been since from e-commerce, marketplace, digital business, B2B and uh, automobile, even into the public sector. So I have seen a lot in this area. And that is the reason I really like writing uh, and uh, uh, reviewing articles and series squad. I have started doing that a little bit more than a year ago. So far I have written uh, 130 blog posts and I also started sharing YouTube, still a very new thing for me, but I like learning from everyone. And I see myself as a very curious person. So I try to learn from everyone around me because I believe everyone has something to share and that is what I aim for. And another thing I wanted to share, it's like before I was a pro, I started in the product management area, I was a software developer, but that is because I really like computing and so on. But the reason I, wa I wanted to be a software developer is because I wanted actually to get some money and buy some instruments. I was a guitar player. I had long hair. I wanted to be, uh, I really wanted to be a musician, but due to a lack of talent, I had to retire from this career and I moved to product management. I kept doing that. I decided only to go to concerts and playing instruments was really not my cup of tea. That takes, so, some, uh, that takes some brutal self-honesty, David, to, uh, to admit that you're not good at something. Yeah, but that, uh, <laughs> it took me quite a while to accept that. When I was 14 years old, I started playing guitar and I was training eight hours a day, every single day for at least, I would say, three years. And then I, I reduced because I started working. But I realized it seems I'm putting too much effort for too little outcome. And then I said, Actually, I realize it's it's not really for me. <laughs> uh, excellent, excellent. So let me tell you what we are going to talk today. So mainly what I will share today is based on my experience and my learnings. And I want to walk you through from what I learned, what takes roadmaps to failure. And most of the things here, I have, be, I have either been in a scenario like that or I caused that. So many times I cause situations like this, frustrations as in roadmap. And then once we I walk you through to the bad side, what leads to frustration, what should the good roadmap be? And then at the end of the webinar, I will present objective key results in practice. And here I will share two cases that I experienced. So we should, we should and mention if you do want to ask questions, as Lily's saying in the chat, just go and use the Q&A feature in Zoom 
and we'll try and weave them in or at least leave them for the end. Great. So let's start with roadmaps. What leads to frustration? Roadmap is something that reveals how agile a place is. And whenever I'm about to change the job, I ask, how do you handle your roadmap? Because I have seen so many weird things, let's say. And most of the roadmaps I have experienced are like this, deliver this feature by this time range. And it's a set of solutions defined to be delivered by whom until when, and whom here can be a team and sometimes even worse an individual. So it is the perfect recipe to generate frustration. And why does that happen? It happens. Um, before I, I share why does that happen, I wanted to think what the roadmap should be. And for that, I want to quote Simon Sinek. If you look at this, the role of a leader is not to come up with all the great ideas. The role of a leader is to create an environment in which great ideas can happen. And I think most roadmaps they take to the uh, they take the first mm -hmm. part, defining all the great ideas, but not leaving the space for the team to explore. Yeah, I've seen that happen a lot, and I love Simon's work. I think it, it really applies well to software development. Yeah. So, like, how does it start? Generally, someone outside of the team, and here I will call as management. It can be leadership and can be a director, but the one who is the sponsor, let's say, of the product. He's the one calling the shot. In the case I worked, many times there was an offshore. And the, these people, this group of people, would define what is important next. But curiously, no one from the team was part of that. No product manager, no software engineer, no UI, nobody was there. But the management was defining, well, what is important for us is to replace the system, to have a new tool here, to do this and that, and but defining precisely which solution to implement. And what is the result of that? When the teams got to know that, it's like something is a surprise. And it's like someone is just throwing a roadmap over the fence. Here is what you are gonna do for the next two quarters. Have fun. We want that done, no excuse. And the result of that is obvious, right? The team will be overloaded. And most of these roadmaps, mm, they don't allow teams to collaborate because they are kind of conflicting. It's a, a big list of things to deliver. And why does a team need to deliver that? Because it's important for the business. Generally, that is an explanation. And if we don't do that, our competition is doing, or we need to match the competition. So sometimes, David, I've seen this, I've seen there's another anti pattern, which is the product manager gets um, brought into the management kind of camp and the product manager throws the roadmap over the fence at the team. But again, it's, it's without the team being involved. Yeah, this is also the other side of the coin. And I, I cannot say I've never seen that because I've done that. And... Uh, for example, in one of the places I worked was an e-commerce. We were seven product owners. And before the beginning of the quarter, we had our secret meetings and we would go and discuss like, huh, what could we do next? And then we would come with the ideas. And right before the quarter would start, then I would call the team and say, here is what we are thinking. Is it doable? So see the question, is it doable? And the team would look at me, oh, it seems a lot. Then we would remove one or another item but but i felt something was wrong because at the end of the quarter we were always failing to deliver everything uh, and this is the problem because i was oriented on the solution and the uh, the whole group of product owners were oriented on that in this case management was not really involved so it can come from different sides but the problem is when it becomes a surprise for the team the team will yeah, not commit right. to that. Yeah. And what, where is the focus? The focus is on delivering features. The ultimate goal is to get the feature done by the end of the roadmap timeline. That's it. What for? What for is a good question. And that causes a relationship that I call as a service provider relationship. We come with the ideas and you, dear team, deliver it. So 
and then you start, uh, what is the result? It's, it's really bad because developers, they start questioning. I remember once one developer said, Dave, they really like the detail you bring to us. But one thing it's really missing, as a developer, I want to know the problem I'm solving. And you are never telling us that. You were telling why it's important to build these and why uh, these will lead us to a more successful business. But I'm missing the problem we are solving. And I, I, I'm saying that because maybe there's another solution. And when I heard that, I said, hmm, unfortunately, he's deadly right. And I have been leading teams directly to the pitfall. I learned the hard way. That started in 2012 when I had my first job as a product manager. And then I started leading teams in this direction that has generated a lot of failures. But then I start thinking, what could be a good roadmap? Because if we treat the roadmap as a plan, what happens? Let's take a sentence here from the army, a plan. No plan of operations extends with certainty beyond the first encounter with the enemy's main strength. It's a little bit complex, but I like looking at this with a different eyes. For me, it's like this. No plan can survive the first contact with the customer. No matter what you think it's right, once you present to the customer, hmm, you're going to be surprised. The old enemy. If we didn't have to have customers, our roadmaps would be perfect. Exactly. exactly. So roadmaps, they should set a direction, but the, the path is unknown and we should accept that. Mm. That's good. And now, what do I think a roadmap should include? What are the ingredients we need like for successful roadmap? And this is the key aspect I'd like to share with you. The first part for me comes from this. Ownership from the product teams. Roadmap should be no surprise for them because they are accountable and they are the owner of that. And care they can only achieve this if there's an empowerment from the management. And I see a strong collaboration. For example, the management sets the direction, which is the objective we want to achieve, where we want to be. And then the team will say, what are the steps we can take to get there? And here we will generate like a definition of ownership. We are the ones who define the solution and we will prove if that is right or wrong and we will explore. It is challenging because the team then has more responsibility and some teams also don't want to have this responsibility because in a feature roadmap, well, if it failed, I haven't defined anything, it was somebody else, then it's not my fault. In a roadmap where we define key results, then if it failed, the product team was the one making the decision. So it is a different set of things, but now people want more ownership than just command and control. I think very important aspect, where is the focus? Is the focus on what you want to achieve or what we want to deliver? Because if the focus is on what we want to achieve, the conversation will be, how can we get there? And that, will lead to a scientific approach, learn more, explore, produce knowledge. And if it is, how can we deliver that? It will be an implementation approach. Let's break that down mm. into one mm. chunks and make it happen. Jeff Patton has a great quote about this. He's a, um, a well-known product management trainer. And he says, the point about making great software is, is not to make great software. The point is to change the world. So what you want to look at is how am I changing the world, not did I ship some great software? Yes, it totally resonates with me and I cannot agree more with that. This is amazing. And connected to this is less is more because like the problem in roadmap is people want to achieve a lot in a short period of time, but this is just fooling ourselves. Because the moment we believe we can do more in less time, 
we will fool ourselves. And sometimes I had the impression of uh, there's this famous book from uh, Jeff Sutherland. I don't remember exactly the words, but it's the art of doing double the work and half the time, something like this. For yeah. me, I perceive that as uh, people read this and they the result is the art of producing double the bugs and half of the time because we rush and then we generate more problems instead of more outcome. Yeah, I, there's a great, there's a Navy pilot I heard. I think, it, I think it was watching the new Top Gun behind the scenes. And he was saying that they teach the Navy aviators that, uh, that going slow is smooth and going smooth is fast. So if you want to go fast, first of all, you go slow and make sure you do it smoothly. And that'll mean that you go faster. And I think that's really, that's really true with, with roadmaps. If you're trying to push too much through at once, you end up getting blocked and nothing comes out the other end. And if you focus on less, you actually start to get momentum and then you can chew through more. Yeah, that resonates with me because I see like in Scrum, for example, a lot of people work with this, there's a sprint and that means speed. And speed is not always good. It reminds me from my childhood, road trips with my parents. Uh, my dad wanted to arrive fast and then he was speeding. We didn't have a GPS back then. So my mom was doing the best she could with the maps. And what turned to be is the moment she said, you have to turn right, my dad was already too far from that. And then we needed to take a return. And actually the only thing the speed helped us doing was getting there late because we couldn't make the things right because we were too fast to understand what was happening. And it's the same in the product. Some things, they just take time and we need to accept that. Yeah, that's a great example. And the last part, what I see in the roadmap for successful one, it has to foster collaboration. Because as I'm, I gave the example of seven product owners defining the roadmap and we had a lot of teams back then, but it doesn't mean that even though we were in a room, we were defining some things that would foster collaboration among the team. We had things that were conflicting. And this is a problem because let's say if one team has a goal of reducing the um, customer acquisition costs and the other team has of increasing revenue, you see the conflict already. How, how can we collaborate? And if the team is saying, well, I have to do this uh, I know I should help you, but actually you should also help me. And then it, it, it generates a deadlock and we get nowhere, but to a competition. And competition is the right thing to lead the roadmap in a direction we don't want. It will frustrate. But then the question is, how can we create a solid roadmap? For me, everything starts with a product vision because Imagine a roadmap with product vision. If you don't know where you wanna be, how can you define what is part of that? Everything becomes a candidate for it. Everything can be arguably a priority. I can find a reason for everything. I can say this is important because it increases sales. This is important because it will speed up our delivery time or something like this. And you can find reasons, but what is the product vision? For me, a product vision is something that is challenging and inspiring and possible to achieve. And there's a time boundary. I like taking one from Kennedy in the 60s. He said, by the end of the decade, we will land the man on the moon and return him back safe on earth. And then you think, whoa, land the man on the moon and return him back safe. That is challenging, but possible maybe, don't know, maybe it's possible. And there's a time by the end of the decade, and the idea of a roadmap, it will set a direction, is a North Star. The team can look and say, what should we do next to get to this roadmap? And then set the objectives, set the goals instead of the features. What do we need to achieve to get there instead of uh, what do we need to build to get there? So not, not putting a flag on the moon, but, um, but having goals that are, that are kind of more uh, outcome-based, I guess, is what we're talking about. With product vision, for, I always get caught up in, in sometimes the business has a vision and the business has a purpose. 
And so product vision is very clear. It's about aligning and supporting that purpose and that vision. Sometimes there isn't a strategy, there's just budgets. Like next year's budgets get set and you've just got to make more revenue or something else is like, it has no relationship to the product. It's just someone said, we've decided to lift revenue by 10% this year because that's what we do every year. So work out how to make it happen. Um, have you seen product vision going up as well as coming down? Yeah, I, I have seen uh, these scenarios. And the truth is most place I have observed, they are dysfunctional in terms of product uh, strategy. It is, the goal is to increase revenue. The goal is to uh, reduce costs and so on. But what is the vision? Well, there's no product vision itself. Then we have two choices as a product person, I would say, it can be a product owner, product manager, but the responsible for that. One is we, we accept the status quo and we live like that, or we challenge. And what is the importance of challenge? To produce something great. Because if we just accept, of course, the stakeholders will come with budgets and so on and say, we want these and these and that. But as a product person, we should be a leader. And then we should say, well, you can go this direction, but then we will not get exactly something meaningful because we're just trying to do everything in parallel. What I like doing is setting a product goal. And the product goal is the next step. Even if we don't have a vision, like what do you need to achieve next? And then we say, what does it help us getting there? And whatever that doesn't, we say it is later. It's for another conversation. It's one product go at a time. For example, when we look at SpaceX, product vision could be, let's populate Mars. Well, this is too hard to imagine, but what is the next step for that? They already did, but it's to build a reusable rocket and then put all the efforts in making that happen. And this can come bottom up because the team can say, what we are looking here, it is we need to achieve this. Can we commit to this goal? And once we achieve, we go to the next and to the next. And it's a kind of coaching because if the organization doesn't know how to build product, the product owner or the product manager should help them understanding. Because it's like Steve Jobs said a lot of time, you don't hire a lot of smart people to tell them how to do their work. You hire them to tell you how to do that. Yeah, exactly. That's good. That's good. Yeah. And the secret is the roadmap. You start with the vision, you define to go the goals to get closer there. But still, you need to have a room of learning because we need simply to accept we don't know how to get there. That is reality. We don't know. Nothing different than that. And the faster we learn, the quicker we can succeed. And if we are not embraced learning, it is a sign we are focusing on solutions instead of problems. Solid roadmaps, they give the room to experiment. And this is why I want to go through OKRs. Because OKRs are very simple. Objective and key results. And objective is what? What do we want to achieve? The main goal. And the key result, what gets us closer to this goal? What are the results we need to deliver? This started like with Intel and then Google started using. And John Doerr wrote a book, Measure What Matters. That is, I think for product managers is a must read. It gives clarity, a lot of stories and so on. And what, but still, when we look to the OKRs, it's easy to fall into the same traps as roadmap, not different. And the first one here I wanna say is the confusion. Because imagine as the example I, I gave before, increasing revenue and uh, reducing customer acquisition costs. They might be conflicting. And how can departments collaborate? An objective should be in a higher level and then the teams can break that down to key results. But it should be in a way that generates like clarity and the team can col collaborate instead of being confused. How can we work with that? And the second part is restriction. No space for creativity. This is what happens quite often when teams are migrating from traditional roadmaps to OKRs. So the objective, for example, is 
uh, reduce the customer acquisition costs. And the key result, implement a referral program by the end of Q1, Q2. And then you look at this, this is the solution and the team has no room of exploring. They may explore on how to implement a referral program, but here is a state that the referral program is the right thing to do. And that's not how OKR should work. And the other aspect that can generate is a mistrust. The management still defines the objective and the key results. And then the team needs to deliver some numbers or some result without agreeing to that. And if that happens, the team will have no ownership to that and they will not feel accountable. So if they fail, they say, okay, I was not the one who said we can do that. OKRs is a collaborative tool, not a one that ever it's defined separated. So David, like, there's, yeah. there's a question that's come up in the chat from Antonio Rodriguez, which is one of the main situations I have is to validate the roadmap with my clients. They are expecting some features that are critical to them to be delivered by a date. How can OKRs help with those conversations when, when the clients are so feature oriented? Well, this is like um, going step by step because the first part is a feature is a means to an end. A feature is not the end itself. A feature needs to deliver something. And it is like, what do you need this feature for? Once the feature is live, what do you want to achieve? How does it change your life? And it's going to a conversation from uh, when to implement these features from what is that for? And understanding the end. And once you can get to the end, then you can go back to the OKRs, but it's one step at a time. Uh, because what I, I say is, for example, you take a scenario that is totally feature-oriented. If you try to implement everything at once, it's like there's a mountain of things that needs to happen. People will be scared. But actually, it's not getting to the top of the mountain that you should focus on. It's like, what is the next step I can do now? And I think the next step is understanding what is the goal of the feature, and then asking for permission to explore with different solutions and challenge, is this the right way of getting to the result you want? Can we explore with different possibilities? That's yeah, what that I makes sense. And, and I think the, um, the other thing I would say is with your roadmaps that you publish to clients, I wouldn't publish a list of features in the roadmap. I try and publish a list of those objectives you're trying to help them achieve, because then you can say we're doing something about um, user experience, or we're doing something about accessibility, or we're doing something about the this particular process, without being too specific about what you're going to do, because you're you're not sure with agile, you're never sure that you will achieve everything that you set out to do, and so you want to leave some wriggle room for maybe finding a better solution, but also maybe it's just taking longer to deliver you think yeah i totally agree and uh it's i have received this request quite often what is your roadmap and people expect to see the features that are going to be delivered and when i show them like a, one objective and three bullet points they say okay but i want to know the road i said that is the roadmap and uh, on the way we will deliver some things and you will get to know but we want to focus on the outcome here so you mentioned when you're interviewing, you wanted to see the roadmap. And so is that what you're looking for? Have they got a list yes. of features or? A... Yeah. Okay. Because for me, when I see the roadmap is a list of features, I realize that the agile, um, let's say, uh, maturity of the company is still low because they are still on the feature. And then I need to decide, is it the place I want to go to be? Because then I need to fight this. And I want to understand where are the things, like the problems, and because then, I, like in a, I have, I have fought that for a lot of times, mm. and if I see like a strong thing there, then that's not a place for me. Um, uh, the book you mentioned was by John Doa. Yeah. Measure um, what matters. Measure what matters. Okay, I'll put that into the chat. His name. So great. And here is a quote from him that is related to the OKR. We must realize 
and act on the realization that if we try to focus on everything, we focus on nothing. And this is a trap because it's so easy trying to do everything. And we believe that we can parallelize. We believe we can multitask. We say multitask is, is what defines good product management. And uh, multitasking is actually not uh, like context switching. We are just adding uh, processing to our brain and we become slower. And the truth is focus on one step at a time, make that happen and then go to the next and the next. And this is what leads to great product results, I would say. Now I want to share with you two examples of OKRs. The first one here, it is about a wine online shop. It was in Brazil and um, this was a startup. Let me give you an overview of the market very quickly. First of all, Brazilians don't like drinking wine. It's seen as a, an expensive drink and, uh, and Brazil is hot. People think that wine is for cold in Brazil and uh, people drink, drink beer. That's what happened there. And then on top of that, the ones who drink wine, they buy online from wine.com.br that owns 75% of the market share. And the Vino, that is the startup I'm talking about, decided to compete in this market through a differentiation. They had the assumption, instead of selling the known labels from famous regions, what if we could sell wines from these regions, but the ones that are unknown and the people cannot find anywhere else in Brazil. Then they started importing wine from Europe, like from Bordeaux, Valdepeña, Sicilia, and fa famous regions, but unknown labels. I can, I can market, say their mistake, they should have been importing Aussie and New Zealand wines. That's, that's their mis first mistake, wines from Europe. <laughs> yeah, I think we had also some, uh, some, some wines from Australia, but that came later. But first was just testing how the business worked. But uh, it was growing quite sustainably and growing quite fast. We realized there was still potential in Brazil. Brazil is a country of 220 million people, if I'm not mis uh, 210 million people. And the average uh, of a wine per person is one and a half bottle per year per person. When you look at France, it's 60. And we said, if we get Brazil to a little bit more, there's something. But what happened? We were growing. But as all startups at the beginning, you only grow by putting money. And uh, I was in the company for, a while, for two months only. I had just started. And then there were three co-founders. It was the day we were waiting for to get to know the roadmap. Then they came to the room and start saying, we are going to implement for the next quarter a new product detail page, a new card. Also, we need to change our notification system and we need to implement a newsletter. And the list, uh, the list keep, kept going and going. And then I, I couldn't understand that. We were small, we had three teams only, that's it, no more than that. And then I, I had to say, I saw, said, sorry, I need to ask a question. What is the most important thing with the next step? And the, the CEO said, everything is important. We need to do everything. I said, I agree, everything is important, but I want to know which is the next. Because looking at the team size, I cannot deliver all of this. We need to focus. And then he was quiet for a while. And uh, he said, why do we need to focus? We have three teams. We can just uh, divide and conquer. Just give a little bit for everyone. I said, yeah, because actually, if we try to do this, we will just deliver solutions. But here I'm missing something. I'm missing what would we achieve with a new product detail page, a new card and a new notification system. I don't see the connection. What is the outcome we want to deliver? I, I want to know which is the biggest problem we have now in the company. Maybe we should focus on solving that. And that is when something interesting happened. Someone from marketing, it was an intern, raised the hand, very shy. She said, I, I think I know what problem we have. And she, she said, we are pouring money into customer acquisition. And that is driving our customer acquisition cost like it, to the moon. It is really high. And if we keep like this, we will run out of cash because 
what we pay for the, uh, to acquire customers, they don't give it back. They don't buy this amount of wine. And then one CEO said, hmm, or because we had like co-CEOs, we had three, uh, we like more. And then one said, yeah, that's not a problem. That's how startups work. This is okay. We are just, uh, <laughs> uh, that we are buying so, revenue and then we will become sustainable. That is okay. It, it works for Google. It'll, it'll work for us, yeah. Yeah. But the other one looking at the, the other one was focused on the finance. He said, actually, this is not okay. It is true if we keep like this. And I mentioned a lot of times, it seems he was irritated. He said, I mentioned a lot of times, if we keep like this, we need investment. And it will be hard to convince if we keep within the customer lifetime value. We need to do something. And he said, we need to reach break even. I said, now we are talking. I said, so it seems that there is a goal of reaching break even. And there are some problems here. Customer lifetime value too low, acquisition costs too high. They said, maybe here's where we could talk. And I said, okay, let's give it a try what you are saying. And then we could agree on a go, reach break even. And we said, what would lead us to break even? What do we need to do to do that? And then we said, put it down, customer acquisition cost 20%, increase customer lifetime value 15%, and reduce the return rate. If we get to these three things, we reach break even. And here you can see there's no solution defined in any of this. We know what we want to achieve, we know the goal. And that was a really interesting conversation. And then someone said, What happens with all the other things? I said, All the other things, they will wait. Once we, I said, First things first. I said, Our business is not profitable. It's not going to be, if you keep like this, I said, product detail page will, will, will not. I said, it might be important and eventually you can focus on that, but let's see here, how can we achieve this? And they said, okay, let's give it a try to this, but you are accountable for achieving this result. It is your responsibility. And this is okay. a trick because when it comes uh, accountability, it means you set the, uh, the key result together, but then you are accountable. And some teams like that, but in the future roadmap, you are not accountable because someone else decided that. And if it doesn't lead anywhere, you say, hmm, I didn't define this, but I like having the responsibility because this is how uh, it motivates me. And the beauty of that is we didn't deliver exactly and we were not successful at the first attempt. We had different uh, trials to implement a cheaper customer acquisition uh, cost. And the first three one, we did in a design sprint to understand the problem and so on. We failed. We couldn't get to anything that would lead us in this direction. But the fourth one, we found a way of uh, uh, a campaign when we call it share your wine love, uh, your love for wine with your best friend. And then you bring your friend here, your friend become a client, you both will get an exclusive bottle of wine. It is not sellable in the shop. You can only get that through a referral program. And uh, what was the cost of a customer acquisition? Two bottles of wine, cheaper than everything else. And then the customer said, I want this bottle of wine. And we started changing. Every week was a different bottle. And they couldn't buy this. And customers, it was kind of competition. I want to bring people. I want to get the ex exclusive bottle of wine. And then we got to a cheaper customer acquisition chain, which was actually way cheaper than 20%. And then we could succeed. But it, was, but it wasn't, I bet it wasn't on that original list they had of things, that no. the features, no. No, it was not. It, uh, it, it was totally not. There was product review, they said uh, customers will buy once there are reviews in the wines and uh, th there was some assumptions like this, but uh, we said, but it's not connected to this. Um, and uh, we had the room of exploring and the space to learn. And we knew, we, we knew what we didn't know. We didn't know the solution to get there. And then we had to explore with different ones. Excellent. And it would it takes people being involved from across the company too, because I'm imagining it's not the developers don't necessarily know that there's bottles of wine you can't get through the website that you could give away. 
Yeah, uh, that, that is something that happened. We, we, in the design sprint, we involved different people from like a uh, ca category, manage, uh, category management department, finance. We had also some, some problems there because we wanted to give the wine for free, but in Brazil, it's not so simple to put the wine for free in invoice. And then the account, the, the account will say, you cannot do that because we pay something for this. How can we just give it for free? I said, I, I don't even know if this idea works. So let's just make it happen somehow. And then once we, we prove it work, so they say, okay, I'm going to do something here. But it's not right. So but first, let's learn. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Now we share a second case with you. Uh, it was in a... In Brazil, still, like a company was falling. It's called Instacarro. Selling second cars in Brazil is, is hard because people try to cheat on you, and then they it takes a lot of time and effort. And this company wanted really to disrupt the secondhand car market. And the idea was simple: you bring your car to one of our inspections point. Someone is going to take some pictures, and we put your car in an auction platform, and dealers all over Brazil compete for your car. At the end of this, you receive the highest bid. You decide to take it or leave. If you take, you go home by cab. If you leave, you go home by your, with your car and you don't pay anything. All of this process took one hour. So it's like you sell your car in one hour. That was our value proposition. And uh, it was a startup. I joined there. There were 30 people. It was on the fourth month when I joined. And what happened? It was more or less a similar story. It was really like a startup. On a Sunday, before I started, the CEO called me and said, well, there's a problem here. You cannot go to the office tomorrow. My wife is sick. I'm in a hospital. Here's the address. You come here tomorrow, and then I will tell you what, what you have to do. And I was starting there as a product manager. And then I went to the hospital. And the conversation with the CEO didn't last more than 10 minutes. He just... Uh, told me a little bit about the business, the challenge and what is happening. And he said, the truth is the following. We burn more or less $1 million a month. And if we keep like this, we have six months of, of cash. Uh, and the reason is because we are not selling cars and uh, we are not selling because dealers are not participating in our auction. And your mission is to increase the participation by 30% on our app. I don't want excuse, I want that done. Stood up, went away. I had no, no space to say anything. And then I was reflecting for a while. I said, he said, the reason's not profitable. Customers are not taking the offer. He also said that uh, we need to increase the engagement by 30% in the app. But I said, I will just stick to the numbers. Then. I went to the office, I talked to some people. The next day I talked to him, he went to the office. I said, can I do that my way uh, without involving you? You said I, I got enough information. I rephrased these things and he said, I don't care what we're gonna do. Just uh, get it done. I said, okay. Then I went to, to talk to the teams and I said, we need to set a goal here, an objective and then define what we could do for that. And to do this, I was talking to the team, understanding the biggest problem. We couldn't make a good offer to the clients because imagine you are a dealer, you participate in an auction. It's you and one more person. It means like if the car worth $10,000 and you place a bid of 5,000 and then another put a bid of 5,500, you may put six and then the bid will the auction will finish. You have the perception you won the auction. It doesn't mean you bought the car because still the car owner needs to accept. And then I realized this problem. I said, okay, so what we need to do is to offer a reasonable price for the, uh, for the cars. So that's what we need to do. Until we, we offer a reasonable price, we don't have any business. People will not sell their cars for half of the price. And then I talked to some people in the operations and we agreed on this. And then I went to talk to the developers and said, what could they do to reach this? I said, well, I will be honest with you. In our participation, it's maximum five dealers participating. Sometimes we have six, seven. I said, what if we could increase that by 50%? 
And then it said, oh, that would be interesting. I said, if we increase by 6%, we, uh, uh, 50%, we increase the competition. And then we could also increase the bid per auction. And eventually the dealers would keep coming because what happened is dealers would participate in a couple of auctions and they would never come back because they would say, I place bids. I cannot buy any car. Nobody's selling this to me. Why would I come back here? So we defined the objectives. But then I had to do some research. I said, now I need to understand how these guys work. And uh, instead of asking, I want to observe them, where they work. I visited 20 dealers. And what I got to know was actually, they hated the app and they didn't buy cars from apps. They were using like portals, one called web motors. And they were going and looking to the cars and a lot of details and so on. 21 inch screen, sometimes the bigger one, 27. And I asked them like, how do you find the cars you want? I said, well, that is tricky, but generally I search a lot on the web and I said, what do you search for? And then I started getting to know what they search for and how they search. And I realized everything they, they used as a parameter for buying the car, we didn't provide this information. So first thing we adapted how we presented the car on the platform. And the second, I said, we are using the wrong solution. They want to participate in this auction, but they don't want to use an app. They think it's not the right way of buying cars. And then I I asked the developers, could we try out with a web platform? They said, well, we have the APIs for that and so on. We could build a quick front end and see what happens. And once we did that, we increased the the result by 50% from one day to the other. And then it starts like growing crazy and dealers start saying, I have this new platform, it's crazy to buy cars. And they start talking to their friends. And to make this story short, we, we achieved much more than that. And we, could, uh, we went from buying five cars a month, that's what we did at the, uh, the first month I was there, to 600. Oh, that's, a, that's a big yeah. increase. Yeah, we went from five cars a month to 600 in three months. So that was the change. And then the CEO said, well, I'm so proud of what you did with the app. And uh, how did you do that? I said, actually, we discontinued the app. We don't use it anymore. (laughs) That's hilarious. I'm I'm just looking at time and we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I know that we're at the end of your slides. So let's open up for questions and uh, don't be shy. There's, you can use the Q&A or the chat. We'll, we'll deal with questions on either one. And we'll wait with bated breath. But I do that, like David, what I love about those examples you gave is how much they resonate with my own experience of being a product manager. Um, being micromanaged by executives to deliver features. Um, I've thrown the odd roadmap over the fence and then kind of wondered why, the, why, why were the developers so disgruntled? And, why didn't they want to help us achieve it? Um, and I love, I've actually been working with a client that uses OKRs, but I'm pretty sure they're not using them right. And uh, I'm going to have to read those, uh, some of those books you mentioned myself. So we've got one from Ralph. Great question. Um, he says, hi, David. I have a scrum team that questions why they need OKRs when they already have a backlog with everything in there on what to work on. They also ask what happens when they discover something on the way that shows the objective's not valid anymore and they want to pivot. How can I convince them that OKRs are a good complement to Scrum? Yeah, so that's the thing. I would first uh, ask you one question. How big is the backlog? Because the backlog should reflect learning. And uh, for me, if the backlog is bigger than three months old, it's a sign we are falling in love with the solution and not with the problem. But in Scrum, we have this sprint goal. Mm-hmm. And what is this sprint goal connected to? If you think about it, you have a, lot, a backlog full of things to do, but what, what, what are they connected to? How can they set the team in a unique direction? So you define the sprint goal and then you go to this to sprint. But 
is it a sprint goal to deliver all the features by the end of the sprint or is it to achieve something? And this something should be a step towards something else. And that could be the OKR. And it's a way of having the big picture in mind. Because for me, uh, Scrum is a means to an end and it cannot be the end itself. And we don't do Scrum for the sake of doing Scrum. We do Scrum to make better products, to deliver value. And what is value? So OKRs will give clarity on what is important and will help us prioritize what is not and say no to everything that distracts us. I would ask the team, like, how often do you feel distracted? How often something comes to your plate and you cannot say no because you don't have something to say, this is where we're going. And if it doesn't help, and it's no. Yeah, I think, I think it also might be a sign that the OKRs are not being set particularly well. So if your OKRs can be challenged by something, if your objective can be challenged by something that comes up during a sprint, um, that makes me think that the objective maybe isn't very, isn't high level enough. It's a little too low level. It's maybe got some solution in there and it's the solution that they're challenging. Yeah, I totally agree with you because uh, the objective, well, if you're challenging the objective, you're challenging where you want to land. And uh, that would be something that our vision is wrong, more or less like this. So yeah. it's something bigger. But yeah. if we're challenging the solution, then I say, then it's fine. But then the OKRs is wrong. Yeah, that's right. Um, Antonio asked another one. He said, could you tell us something about cascading OKRs down from product team to dev teams? Yeah, uh, this is something that is uh, challenging because cas I, I, OKRs, they start from the bottom up, from the leadership, and then we should, from that, define micro objectives. So the secret is having a main one, like, become profitable. So what leads to profitability? And then the team can say, okay, to become profitable, we achieve these key results. And then you can say, ah, become profitable. Another key result for that could, could, could be um, acquiring customers sustainably, so for example, because it's connected to profitability. And then you can bring, break that to one team. And then become profitable can be, we are communicating with the client at the right moment or within the right information and so on. That is the, the, the objective. So you can give that to another team. But still, everything is connected to a main goal. And what can easily happen is if it starts bottom up instead of top down, if start bottom up, the team starts setting the objectives and then it goes in a wrong direction. They're trying to shoehorn it into a a top level objective without really it being aligned. They're still trying yep. to do what they used to do, which is deciding what to do themselves. And they're not really letting it set them. I, I've seen, um, when I'm working with clients around strategy and product strategy, I ask two questions. I ask why, like, why is this here? Why, why are you doing this? Why, why is that important? And can you prove it? And if you can prove, can you prove why you think it's important now, but also, can you prove when it works? What, what's the metric you're gonna to use to know that it's worked or not worked? Like we, we have to do this to make more profit. Can you, okay, so you've got the why. Why do you think, why do you think this makes more profit? Why do you think this is gonna help? And can you prove it? Can you prove that that will help? But also when you start to do it, will you be able to prove that it's working? That helps bring alignment because sometimes the why is not actually really well thought about and the why is well we knew we needed to do this six months ago and we've been waiting to do it and we need to do it um, and the why is not strong enough to actually let you do it so i'll see if there's any more questions out there otherwise i'll start talking about brisket come on It's a shame, David, you're in Germany. We can't travel because I can't, I can't share my brisket with you. Oh, yeah, I, that's a shame. And I, I haven't been to Australia. I want to go also. Well, you'll have to visit. You'll love it. Okay, so maybe I should do some elevator music. 
Oh, Sarah Maria says, one. thank you very much for sharing the insights. And we've got a few other thank yous. Um, thank you, everyone. We might wrap up if there's no other questions, because I do know that David has to start his day. Oh, hang on. We've got a good one. Ralph said, how does your product goal and objectives compare? Product goals and objectives. The product goal is one step you want to achieve, and it's the next one. In the objective is where you want to be it's what what you want to reach i think it's how you want to change the world like what's how does the world change because you did something that's for me that's the product goal like that's right yeah the exactly is the objective is we're changing the world somehow making it a better place hopefully um your product goal is a step towards that exactly okay guys thank you very much We'll wrap it up there. Thank you, David, for getting up so early and spending some time with us. And thanks to everyone who um, to came on board. We hope you like it. If you're watching this later, tough you didn't get to ask, ask questions, but send me an email at angus at terram.com.au and I can forward it to David. And David's on Medium, LinkedIn, and Twitter. If you look for him like he's uh, got his name there, you'll find him. Thanks, guys. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. It was a Thank pleasure you. talking to you.